We acknowledge that this event is taking place upon the traditional territories. The territories of the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations Confederacy, the Anishinaabe peoples of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nations, and before them the Chinantan Nation called the Neutral by the French and the Attawandaran by the surrounding nations. These peoples are the original caretakers, the peoples who lived and ultimately worked with these lands. We acknowledge that we have a responsibility to know and understand their heritage. The treaty that was signed for this territory is the Between the Lakes Treaty, number three, of 1792, and further the deed referred to as the Haldeman Proclamation of 1784, which applies to land six miles on either side of the Grand River, from the mouth to its source. We need to be aware of our role in these documents. We also acknowledge the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples upon this land. We acknowledge that we have an obligation to learn to live wisely together on this land. Hello, my name is Nathan Etherington. I'm the Program and Community Coordinator for the Brant Historical Society. I'm here tonight to introduce Jean Farquharson. She received her BA and Master's of Library and Information Science before serving as a teacher librarian in many Brant County schools and retired from BCI in 1989. She has been involved with many heritage organizations and served as the librarian and co-chair for the Brant Ontario Genealogical Society, as well as a newsletter editor for the Grand River Heritage Mind Society, the York Grand River Historical Society, and the Canadian Industrial Heritage Centre. She has also edited several books, including Herons and Cobblestones. Hello. My name is Jean Farquharson, and my topic today is Gypsum, the Rock Nobody Knows, or it could be an alternative, What Made Paris Rock? It's all about the mines and mills along the Grand River and how they affected the settlement in this area. It all started in 1793 when Augustus Jones, Surveyor General for Upper Canada, was ordered by His Excellency, the new Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada, John Gray Simcoe, to survey a road for the defense of the new undeveloped wilderness colony. At that point, he had decided to make London the capital of Upper Canada and wanted to build a military road from Dundas across. So Jones recorded in his diary when he came to the Grand River that, that he found a soft grayish white rock deposited in the exposed bread rock. He called it Plaster of Paris. When he returned home, he mentioned it to his enterprising loyalist friends, Benjamin Canby and William Hamilton, both loyalists, who purchased or obtained some of the lands at the forks of the Myth and the Grand Rivers that contained the plaster beds but they also acquired the water power rights. In a local history of Paris, at the Forks of the Grand by Donald A. Smith, who was the principal of Paris High School, he relates that Augustus Jones was paid by Joseph Brandt for a surveying with a 999-year lease to land, as we can see on this rough map from Smith's book, on the east side of the Grand River, uh, above and below Dundas Street, extending for a mile eastward. So he got a pretty good payment for that. And um, in 1816, William Dixon, who was the founder of Gaul, um, obtained or created um, a, a mine and a mill and a mill race at the end of Green Lane on the Grand River, on the east side of the river. And he let all, any of the farmers who wanted gypsum to help themselves because it was used as land plaster, or fertilizer, type of fertilizer. And that's how Green Lane got its name because when the wagons went up and down the lane, they dropped gypsum and the, the grass was always greener where it, where it dropped. 
1822, a wealthy Quaker named, uh, family named Home bought from Canby about a thousand acres. And this is where it is. Plus, he obtained this as well. And he decided that he wanted, a, they decided, the family decided they wanted a, an estate. They weren't going to develop a town. So they had a thousand acres there, and they leased the plaster and power rights from Canby. And at first, his ser ser uh, servants just dug the plaster out of the side of the bank. This mine was located just where the Nith River flows into the Grand River um, at downtown Paris. And this was the first gypsum mine in Ontario. The next year they built a little plaster mill to grind the plaster up, and that was the first gypsum mill in Ontario. You may wonder, what is gypsum? And how it was formed? What is it used for? Um, it is chemically calcium sulfate with two parts water, H2O. And it's often called land plaster or plaster of Paris as well as gypsum. Gypsum formed many millions of years ago before the dinosaur age when the ancient tropical seas covered our continent. And when the seas evaporated, the deposits left on the seabeds piled up containing the small animals and so on that had died over the millions of years. And the deposit of gypsum formed in lens-shaped beds among the limestone, dolomite, and share that was shale that was formed on the ocean bed from these deposits millions of years ago, now uh, bedrock. And some of it was in crystallized form, some of it in white or gray, soft rock, and some of it in a different form, selenite or alabaster. Uh, what is it used for? Back in the early days, it was used as a type of fertilizer, but it was also used to mix to make stucco for the houses around Paris and elsewhere, and also it was used in work for making plaster and walls and so on. And it was also used for paint called alabastine, which is made out of a powder that you mix with water. Gypsum was found in outcrops of bedrock along the Grand River. You remember that the Paris Moraine has glacial and glacial and flute fluvial deposits of till and sand and gravel. And over the centuries, as the Grand River developed, the, the valley got deeper, the bedrock was exposed again. And this is where the mines were. This is where the mines were. And so when Augustus Jones came along, this is where he discovered the deposits of gypsum, and this is where the settlers found it when they came, on their farms even. There are many early references to gypsum in a variety of sources, old books, local histories, advertisements, government reports, publications such as The Farmer's Advocate, and lots more, atlases, and so on. The earliest references were in Egypt. It was used in buildings and art and decoration. It was used even inside the pyramids. Ben Franklin did an interesting experiment. He sprinkled plaster of Paris on a hillside in Philadelphia's Bertram Park, and the fertilizer spelled out land plaster used here. And it showed up very well as greener than the rest of the, the bank. In the sketches of Upper Canada, John Howison in 1825 referred to the, the abundance along the Grand River and in William Dixon's mine particularly. 
the finest and most extensive bed of gypsum that has yet been discovered lies in the township of Dumfries, which belongs to William Dick Dixon Esquire. There is a, an agricultural report that came out in 1881, and it's, it describes the early practice of um, using um, fertilizers and so on, and includes gypsum as well. William Hamilton Merritt, the grandson of the founder of the canal, Welling Canal, um, he was a, 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 a miner and an engineer, and he had a, a company down in Alderman County, and he advertised its efficacy as a fertilizer. He was described as a scientific farmer. The George Brown is the last one I want to talk about at Beaupark Farm in Grant County. He was also a scientific farmer and he experimented using gypsum and he also experimented, experimented using implements. And we see in the next slide an advertisement for a sewing attachment which will use, it will sew plaster, sol, ashes, and superphosphates. Those are the fertilizers that they were using in 1880, which is marked on that. Here is a map of the major mines located in Brandon and Haldeman counties in a book published by the Ministry of the Department of Mines in 1964. And it shows the Paris plaster mine and the Torrance mine. Well, the Paris plaster mine turned out to be a whole lot of different mine tunnels all around Paris and the area. And here is a map of Paris, the 1858 terrain map. And the um, Hiram Capron owned all of the territory surrounded by red. His partner, William Randall Curtis, the yellow, and Thomas Coleman, the green, they were partners in forming a gypsum company and mining and milling the gypsum. We'll come back to this map a little bit later because there's some other people I'm going to talk about there. Other mines south of Paris, there was the Cleter Mine and Mill in the 1830s and 40s around Kirby Crescent off Robinson Road. Burroughs Mine and Mill at five, what became Five Oaks in the 1830s to 1850s. The Torrance Mine, we're not quite sure where that was, but Torrance's picture is on, the name is on the map. That was about 1850 on the east side of the Grand River below Paris. Heimers and Wright in the 1890s to about 1900 in this same location, probably the same mine. And we have found um, at least one tunnel along the Grand there. And at Mile Hill, this was really, I guess, what was called the Paris Gypsum Mine in this report that I just mentioned. It, was, it opened up in the 1850s, and the last mine closed in, in 1905. The Whitelands Creek Women's Institute, Tweetsmere History, reported that the tunnels extended like spokes of a wheel from Mile Hill in different directions. Now they're building buildings above this. Um, Heimers, who worked, I mentioned him before, as having a mine on the east side of the river, he worked in, the, in these mines, and he claimed that the Mile Hill mines had two mile long tunnels. Maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but apparently some of them were very long. This is a cross section of a gypsum mine. Actually, it's located down in Haldeman County, the Martindale mine, and later it belonged to the Crown Gypsum Mining Company. And you can see that well, this is a Grand River over hill, and the Martindale farm is here, and they mined from the river 
and dug in and took the gypsum out. And later on, an, uh, uh, this was called an adit. This is called a decline, and it was taken from through from above, above ground, maybe several feet down. Well, here's the elevation. It shows you the elevation here. So different mines were at different levels underground. This is called a decline, and you can see the bedrock, the till, clay, and the silt, and so on. And then a, the bedrock with dolomite, shale, and gypsum lenses within that that they worked away at. The next slide shows an underground mine for the Garland Mine, which was down in Haldeman County. It was a small mine and mined early. You can see that it has a decline. And this, some of the old workings were filled in. There's an air shaft so the miners could breathe fresh air. They would dig in one direction until they got all that they found there, and then they'd go in another direction, and all in different directions, and at different levels sometimes. They had air shafts again, you can see that, and sometimes they'd fill them in, sometimes they'd prop them up with logs and timbers and so on, and, and they'd also prop up the, the ceilings because it's a soft rock and it's collapsible. The next one shows you a huge mine. Here's the, here's the, um, the 500 feet, so you can see the size of this mine. And all the tunnels and supports throughout the whole thing. This is mine number one at Caledonia, which opened about 1905. And there were two other mines that followed that. That sort of gives you an idea of the size of the more modern mines. While the whole family was getting established on their thousand acre estate at the Forks, uh, Hiram Capron, a young Vermonter, made a fortune at Normandale on Lake Erie, investing and working with the partners Van Norman and Tilson to build a very successful ironworks where they produced all kinds of ironware for farming and for households and so on. And when selling his ironware, he visited home in Paris and was enchanted by the gorgeous view at the Forks. He offered to buy Holmes' estate with a dream to found a town there at the beautiful Forks of the Grand. And a few years later, he actually convinced Holmes to sell. So in 1829, Capron moved in. He had Lewis Burwell survey the town for development. He continued his farming, and he developed the gypsum beds and extended the mill race that Holmes had dug out in 1823. Uh, this is how Paris was founded. And why it is named Paris? Because of the gypsum, which was also used to make plaster of Paris. By 1831, he was advertising in the Guelph Mercury 200 tons of ground plaster for sale at my mill, so he was proceeding quite well. By 1857, we see the growth of Paris as described by Capron in a report to the Provincial Exhibition of 1857. By that time, there were three plaster mills and one, two in the lower town, one in the flats, and he had become, he had partners named William Curtis and Thomas Coleman, which I showed you previously on the map. So Thomas Coleman, by 1869 or 70, was the owner of the business, and he was advertising land plaster, white or gray, is the best quality at the lowest price in Paris. Coleman built a large gypsum mill 
on Willow Street in Paris, and it was later sold to some local men, became partners with a man named Thomas B. Church from Michigan, and they formed the Alabastine Company of Paris. The last mine in Paris closed about 1905 because a purer form of gypsum was available at a new mine that opened up in Caledonia by this company. The headquarters remained in Paris for several years, and the name changed to Gypsum Lime and Alabastine, which was a coast-to-coast -coast company, and also later it was bought out by Dominion Tower and Chemical of Don Tower. This is the same plant on Willow Street in Paris in 1950. Still going strong. And across the street, this was the headquarters of the Alabastine Company of Paris that became Gypsum Lime and Alabastine. And this building was just put up for sale. I don't know what its, its, its uh, future is now. Here is a fire insurance atlas showing the uh, map showing the plant and the office. Willow Street, whoops, Willow Street is here. The mill race is right beside it. There's a bridge across to the office. <clears throat> this is the plant, the plaster mill, and then there's storage and shipping and all the rest of it in here. We're back, we're back at Tremaine's 1858 map again, looking at some more names. John Smith had a property at Mile Hill, which was his own active gypsum mine. He was a mason or plasterer in Paris, and he and his family plastered homes. So it was interesting that he had his own mill. Also, John Torrance is mentioned here, but I haven't found very much information about him. But the Armstrong family who lived here came and settled in Paris, and they were former miners. And they went off to Australia, to the gold fields in Australia, to make the money to pay for their firm. And they came back, and they helped open up the tunnels, because they knew how to dig tunnels. Anyway, John Smith left a, whip, a will, and in the, I found this in the archives in Toronto. And he stated that he wanted his wife and children to have the plaster mine, that she shall have the full benefits and management of, of the proceeds of my whole estate, real and personal, including the annual returns from the plaster mines. So it sounds as if it was pretty successful. He also said he, he leaves his family equal shares in the proceeds of the surface and mines, and my will is that none of them shall sell their share of the plaster mine or surface while the mine continues to yield, and no one of them shall hinder or interrupt the working of the mines for the benefit of all. Some of these mine, these deeds and so on that I've found that, well, I can't say I've found them because one of my neighbors, when Park Hill was a legal searcher and she she recorded from the registry office many leases and deeds and all kinds of things in our area, which um, we used as evidence in an OME hearing to prove that well, there were gypsum mines in that area. Um, some of the things that we have are, I have a whole file that, of Wen's work, and it's fascinating to read through these. Some of them cover um, the former Dixon mine as well and other parts of Paris. Also, I have a collection of the government reports on um, gypsum mines and mills from 1863 to 1925. The inspector used to come every year or so and write a report which was published. Also, another source that I found very useful was in the Women's Institute of History. This is the Bethel News from the Paris Star, and it, it tells about um, where the mines were located, on whose property, and all of it. In the 1875 Atlas of Grant County, the map of Paris, 
shows the raceway dug to provide water power for the mill. There were two mill races, three actually, but two in the main part of Paris. Um, and this one shows Willow Street with the mill race beside it. Number seven, which is here, is Thomas Coleman's plaster mill. There are other factors, as you can see. So it was a busy, busy street as far as work is concerned. Some of these existed over in the next map, next part of the map, which is downtown Paris. We have Broadway Street, Grand River Street, bridge across the river, Grand River Street, the main street of Paris. Right around here, the Grand River emptied out underground, crossed under the street, and came up as a mill race, which joined up with a mill race from the, here. And they, it emptied down in here. So this part of Paris was called Coney Island because it's an island right around here. If people talk about Coney Island, now you know what it is. There was a, a Whitlaw mill right downtown in Paris. It was a flour mill and it was interchangeable. It had interchangeable stones so that you could grind gypsum there as well. The 1851 industrial census showed the production and other stats about the mills, about all these mills. It's really quite interesting to look at. And this is a picture, and a really interesting photo, shows the mill race under Grand River Street North as it was being constructed in the middle of downtown Paris. While we were gathering information for this OME hearing, uh, we formed a, a interest of people formed the Grand River Heritage Mind Society. And we used to go on field trips. I did a newsletter for them, and um, we used to do a lot of research as well. So I did a lot of that too. This is a picture of Mile Hill with a collapsed mine, which is evidenced by the sinkhole which was there for many years. I think it's drained now, but this um, shows how the mine collapsed and the property collapsed on top of it. This last and biggest mine in Paris, the Paris Blaster Mine, was owned by Thomas Coleman and right located right at Mile Hill. You can see all the, the mining, old mining roads and so on that wind around down the hill. And we've seen from time to time as the property collapses, openings to some of the tunnels, but most of them I'm sure have collapsed by now. Anyway, we've used many references in books and atlases and so on as well to do our research to find some of these tunnels all over Paris and area. The Canada the, the Gypsum Lime and Alabasting Company was related to the Canada Lab and Plaster Company. Alexander Gill, David Brown, and John Allen were all members of Paris. And they were looking for white gypsum. The, para, the gypsum in Paris was gray and impure. And they needed white gypsum to produce Melvin Church's Alabastine paint and plaster of Paris. And so they did investigations down in Haldeman County and found uh, a purer form of gypsum down there. And they kept uh, selling this alabastine powder paint mixes in hot or cold water. Um, and they even sold stencils to, to use on your walls after you painted the walls. So it was quite a way to decorate back in those days. And it was all done by the Gypsum Lime and Alabasting Company. The name changes were quite frequent in these companies. 
Here's a picture of the miners at Mile Hill Mine, about 1904, just before it closed. You can see that they used horses inside the mines to pull the carts out. Um, up here, you can just, whoops, I need to use this. Uh, up in here, you can just see a, a horse and a cart. See the horse and the cart uh, pulling up the mining roads. They were very steep hills, but they climbed up the roads to draw the Egyptian to the main road. And here they are. You can see the rails coming out of the tunnel. The horses hauled the gypsum, loaded on carts on the rails, and then they put it on wagons and so on and took it away. This is a photo of the same fellows in the previous slide. Um, Mile Hill miners standing at the main entrance. You can see that there are rails coming out of the mine. It looks fairly primitive. It must be a horrible place to work. And they had carts and horses inside the mines to haul the gypsum out. And then it was loaded onto um, wagons or sleds in the winter. And sometimes they used the mill race that was dug at the south end of Paris to haul the gypsum up to the mills. Anyway, uh, it's really interesting to know that some of these people were identified and and can be that were listed in some of the Paris directories and censuses as living in the south end of Paris. Now we move to Haldeman County, where the mines, early mines, opened up as early as 1830, and you can see the places where they opened up: Gypsum Mines Village, which is now a ghost town, Mount Healy, at near York, uh, Garland Carson Mine, Willow Grove, and Lythmore on the Michigan Central Railroad, the Olds, the Kerr, and the Cayuga Mines. I'm not going to talk about all these, but I will talk about some of them this, uh, today, this afternoon. The first one is the Gypsum Mines, which is the ghost town, now a ghost town. It's all reverted back to farms. but. It had a lot of mines, and Mary Nellis is probably one of the most important historians for Haldeman County. She was a school teacher, and she's now dead, unfortunately. And she gave me this map showing the Huff and Jones tracts and all the farms with the names on them and the various mines that belonged. Some of the farmers used to mine their own gypsum and sell it. Some of them would lease the lands out to companies and, and the mining rights to the companies and let them mine it for them. I'm going to talk about just a few that weren't at um, Gypsum Mines, but these are all the companies that operated in the Gypsum Mines area. Probably the most important one was the Grand River Plaster Company which took over the Glenny and Merritt mines. It had a grinding mill, a calcining mill, and it closed in 1893. The Imperial Plaster Company and some of the other companies were large operations and they took gypsum out of smaller mines from different places. The Grand River Navigation Company was an important part of the mining industry because the mines were along the river, the mining tunnels. Therefore, it was cheap transportation to get the gypsum out to the markets. And they used to use scows like this, or they called some of them lighters, and loaded the gypsum from docks along the river where the mines were located and took it to large markets like even Buffalo and different cities and so on were or to the mills where the gypsum was processed. Um, when the Grand River Navigation Company declined and eventually disappeared, a lot of the mines did too because the transportation wasn't so cheap anymore. They, they weren't close enough to the railroads, but the ones that were close to the railroads survived. The Cook and the Martindale mines, I'll show them where they're located on a map further, but this is an 
later ground map showing the Martindale mine on the Grand River. This was a farm and that they used to dig it out uh, um, from a tunnel along the bank, sorry, and it extended quite a distance back in here. And then later this was bought by the Ontario Zippen Company and they had their mine at, at their mill at Lithmore, which was way back. Um, and so there was a track built with a dinky train, a miniature sort of train that took the, the gypsum from the Martindale Farms to Lithmore, or Lithmore. Also, the Mar this was the Martindale, the, the Cooks had a mine next door. They were loyalists and um, they had a grinding mill at York about 1838. They were operating in the 1830s. So here we have a map showing the Martindale mill at York. The Martindale mine at York. This was the Cook and Martindale mines. They were neighbors. And so the dinky train would be going in this direction down with George Lightmore. Here was Mount Healy and Indiana, some of the places along the Grand where they had mills and, and mill races and so on in the Grand River Navigation Company. Here's the mine mill and railway at Lythmore linked to the Martindale mine. And it lasted till 1932. It opened up its own mine when the Martindale mine started to run out, but it flooded a lot, so they gave up. And they already had the mill, so they just took, took it apart and set it up at Caledonia, at the Caledonia mine. Again, here's this map of mine number one. There were three mines in Caledonia. This is the first one. The later ones got even bigger. This shows a banquet for an international geological conference down in one of the mines, just to give you an idea of the extent with its own lighting. And it had almost streets and they had rubber tired vehicles that drove around in the mines and so on. The Mine Society members toured the, the mine number three in Caledonia and also the plant. There, were, there was a long period of amalgamations and name changes and so on which is very complicated. So we had Crown Gypsum, Ontario Gypsum, Gypsum Mine in Alabastine, Dong Tar. Over the years these were different owners, Georgia Pacific um, is now closed and the mill is sold, so that's out of business. So the only one left is the Canadian Gypsum Company uh, close to Hagersville. Both the mine and the mill are still operating. This happened about 2014 and closed and sold. And here's the Canadian Gypsum Company, which began about 1930 and is still in operation. This is a picture of 1951, some of the employees. Here it is as it's operating today. It's interesting that when the Mine Society went on a tour of this mine and plant, it was the day of 9-11. We were down in the mine and when we came up, the world had changed. So as a member of the Grand River Heritage Mind Society, I compiled a, a book and edited a book for us. And it's online on the Brent County Library System website, if you're interested to read it. Also, I um, edited the newsletter 
And uh, I have copies of all the newsletters, but some of them are online on that same website. So this is the end of my story so far, but I hope to put it all into a book. And I want to give credit to all these people and organizations that helped me find the information in so many different sources. Plus the members of the Grand River Heritage Mind Society and the York Grand River Historical Society who worked with me and went on hikes and so on. It was a really enjoyable event to participate in. So this is the end of my story for now. I still owe the community a book for all this work that's been put together. I have all the documentation, so it's my job to put the book together. Thank you.